So once we had gunpowder and you could kill the king, that system doesn't work anymore. So now we have something else. We, we, we went into the nation state era. And the nation state era, the technology that they're providing becomes the issuance of trust. So what does that look like? A land registry is a centralized body that we approach and they give us in return trust. So if I'm doing business and I want to buy Gatto's property, how do I know it's Gatto's property? Do I trust him? Should I trust him if I'm giving him a lot of money? That would be quite foolish because I don't know if he owns it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to a third party, the land titling agency of our country, and they're going to say, you can trust us. We've been keeping track. We have records. You can trust Gatto. This is his property. And now we're going to assign it to you, and now it's your property, right? So this is what a centralized, trust-based institution looks like. And we have that for pretty much everything going on in our lives, especially money. So the way our current monetary system works is we rely on our nation state to issue bonds and debt that the central bank then turns into what we think of as money. And it's a very convoluted uh, process that most of us don't understand because it's almost purposefully confusing so that we don't really question it. All we question is that we go to work, we make our dollars, we make our drum, and then we spend it. And if we're good as citizens, we make that money and we spend that money. And don't worry about anything else. The reality is, is that that is not a good way to have a trust. You, you can't just implicitly trust a trusted system. They need to demonstrate that they're worthy of our trust. And what we've seen, 2008 financial crisis, and, and even before, if you've really been attuned to it, is that they don't deserve our trust. Because one of the downsides of this social technology is that it's really easy for them to be corrupt. So, I'm not saying trustless systems have no value. They have value. They've allowed us to get to this point in time. But the problem with these systems is that they devolve. They no longer function like they did when they got set up. And so we, we, we get to this point now where either you, you, know, you do a revolution, you try to throw out the bad and replace them with the good, or you evolve based on the technology available to us. So in my perspective, we have this new technology I'm about to tell you about that allows us to move past trust towards something that trustless, where you can trust that the product and the system and the services are going to work, but you don't trust a centralized entity to perform and deliver that service. And that fundamentally is this paradigm shift where you're going from centralized to decentralized. So thinking about money, we have centralized uh, treasury <coughs> by the government, which is a centralized entity, uh, administered by a central bank, which has the word central in the name. And then it's, uh, it trickles down to local banks, which you know none of us can really start banks. So, we have a very centralized system that more or less has worked up until now, but it, the cracks are showing and growing, and it, you know, it, it, it's not in a good place right now. Now, move to the decentralized version of this. What we have are essentially networks that, can, that we can trust in without having to trust in any single entity that makes up the network. So that's really confusing. That's not, you know, something that is kind of layman's terms. So what that looks like in terms of cryptocurrency, which is one application of a distributed decentralized network, is that you can now have uh, essentially scarce digital assets that you can trust are, in fact, scarce, right? So you can, so let me take a step back because I feel like this is getting uh, needlessly confusing. So, there's a technology that came out in 2008 called a blockchain. And it's not the end all be all, uh, but it's, it's, it's a very huge step in terms of creating a system through a network that is permissionless, that is trustless, and that is transparent. And so, instead of having this network of, you know, fiat currency, which literally means by decree, you have a network which properties are emergent. We can see exactly how many tokens exist. We can see who, where they're moving, how often they're moving. We can see 
where they're being bought and sold. And so there's no one saying this is how much it's worth. This is how much is going to be issued tomorrow. This is who gets it. There's nothing like that. Everything is programmatic. So Bitcoin is the most famous blockchain-based cryptocurrency. It's the most successful uh, decentralized project in the world right now. And the way it works is that it has predefined code that determines its characteristics. So from day one, they said, this is how many coins are gonna be uh, issued on, how often they're gonna be issued, how the max amount they're gonna be issued, the, here are the incentives that make the system work. Once those are hard coded in, the whole network is now fair. If you decide to participate, you're playing by the same rules as this person, as this person, as this person. So you're taking out the central entity that has power, that can create inflation and create new tokens and give them to their cousin, where that's no longer possible. If you try to do that, the network rejects you. You can try to do it yourself, but you need to bring value to the people that you're trying to bring, attract to this network. All right, so I'm fear, I fear that this is still too abstract. So what does this look like? Are you guys familiar with PayPal? Is PayPal used by the intermediate? So let's think about what is required for someone to transact in PayPal, right? So I pay people, I wanna hire a translator in Armenia, I'm gonna do PayPal, what do I need? <coughs> I need a bank account to hold my money. Well, what do I need to have a bank account? I need a permanent address, I need a driver's license, maybe I need a telephone number, and I need a bank account. So supposing I have all those things, I'm now gonna make a PayPal account, where I give them all that information and I sign up. Now, I wanna to send to Guillermo, who's gonna translate into Spanish for me, what does he need? He needs a bank account, telephone number, address, PayPal account. Finally, he has that. Uh, Madi and I were doing a, an Armenian crypto school on YouTube. We actually mapped out how many ste different steps are required, and each step requires permission for someone else to use my money. So we counted it as 19 steps for me to send money to Guillermo. 19 steps where things can get stuck where I can say, where someone, someone else can say, no, you can't send money to Guillermo. I don't care how good he is at translating Spanish. He lives in another country. Uh, we don't recognize your phone number. You, you don't have, uh, your bank account's frozen your funds. You've exceeded your transaction limit, whatever it is. Our, sorry, our business hours are closed, whatever it is. So 19 steps. If I wanted to send Guillermo Bitcoin or Dash or Litecoin or any of the top cryptocurrencies, it's about four steps. And at no point is there permission. So what I have to do is he, I have to say, Guillermo, I want to send you Bitcoin, download a Bitcoin wallet. He goes on the Play Store, the App Store on his phone, he downloads the wallet. They don't ask who he is, they don't ask where he's from, they don't ask for his telephone number, nothing. He has an app. Say, okay, Guillermo, I want to send you money, you have the app? Yes, I have the app. He sends me the address that he wants the money to go to. That's all I need to pay him. As long as I own Bitcoin and I have an app, and, we're, and our apps communicate with each other, which they do because this is all like protocol level stuff, the same way that when you visit a website, your browser is talking to the website and you're able to connect. Same principles apply. And now I can send him literally as much money as I physically own and no one can stop me. No government can stop me. No security agency can stop me. And at no point does anyone ask who am I or who is he? So as you can see, it's fundamentally different and it's fundamentally different because of all that abstract stuff I was talking about earlier, which is this paradigm shift. In a centralized system, for it to work, requires control. They need to know who I am, and they need to issue me permission to pay money to him. They need to know who he is. Otherwise, a centralized system doesn't work because they need to keep track. You need to trust that the participants in the network are being tracked and are, and are operating in a way that is outlined by the centralized entity. But in a, distributed, in a distributed network, such as Bitcoin or any of these other cryptocurrencies, what is the network itself is providing those properties. And so one of those things is not your identity. You don't need permission, it's permissionless. So because I don't have to trust the network, the network doesn't have to trust me, I'm able to now do things that are impossible in the existing system. So that's just one example. Cryptocurrency is one application of blockchain technology, and there's post-blockchain technology out there as well. So in the future, we might find that the blockchain wasn't the best way to do this, but the principles are not gonna change because they're so much better than the existing one. I
try to use crypto as often as possible. When I try to interact with the banking system, I get so pissed off. I like can't go back anymore. The idea that I have to go during business hours and drive and do business and, and ask for my money and they say, why are, you, well, why are you taking this money? It drives me crazy because I'm used to the future paradigm and I don't want to go back. So whatever the new technology is, it's going to have these properties. Permissionless, trustless, distributed. Something that can't be taken down by a government or a rogue actor or hackers. So this is all a very high level idea. Like what is cryptocurrency and what is the technology underpinning it? But one of the cool things that Gatto alluded to is that the technology that allows for a network that's trustless and permissionless actually applies to many more things besides currency. So currency is the, the, the earliest use case. It's the thing that people are actually using around the world. So we have a Venezuelan here. In Venezuela, they have hyperinflation because their government has so mis abuse the trust of the public that they have hyperinflation, right? We had hyperinflation here in Armenia at one point, right? But here, even Venezuela, it's even worse. So they have, they're losing purchasing power left and right. They're actually turning towards cryptocurrency when the, when the power's on, and they're using Bitcoin and Dash to not necessarily subvert the government, but to su sustain themselves, sustain themselves to, to buy food, you know? So this is where we're at. And, and, and cryptocurrency is a great use case for this technology, but what other times can we envision systems where we would value something that's trustless or permissionless? Uh, and so in the context of co-op, which is a charity organization, we'll just think about how many times are people trusting us? They're, we're taking their money. Do they see what's happening with the money? Can it be more transparent? Can they trust us less? Can it be less centralized? And the answer is yes. If we start integrating these technologies into how co-op operates, we can make it less trusted, or let's say more trustless, which in fact makes it more trusted. So there's things like contracts that we can now digitize and put on the blockchain that execute themselves, where there's no longer counterparty risk. You remove the risk that one of the participants in the, in the contract is gonna rob from you because they physically can't. That's a change, that's a total, total change in how we can do business. I mean, one of the, the big black marks in trying to do business in Armenia, trying to do charity in Armenia is how much corruption there is. Well, what if we make that corruption impossible? It changes the game. So one of the big applications of blockchain technology is through smart contracts. It's a term that you guys should look up. We're gonna make a video about it. Uh, maybe we already have, I can't remember. Uh, so this concept of smart contracts is something that allows you to predefine how a contract should work and it executes itself, meaning it takes the human element out of it. So as long as it's set up properly to begin with, you take out that risk that whoever you're contracting with is going to rip you off because they can't. And it's the same idea with the, why the network can't rip you off by, the Bitcoin network can't rip you off by all of a sudden issuing lots of tokens and devaluing your money. So the same principles, you know, you apply them to all these different areas. And um, we can go into lots and lots of examples, but some of them are so far out in the future that maybe they don't make sense to talk about in this introductory talk. I don't want to confuse people. Uh, but Gato did ask me to talk about tokenization, which is another way of using these networks that rely, again, on these same properties of permissionless and trustless and distributed and decentralized. So what tokenization is, is when you take something concrete, something that's physical or that you can point to as existing, a gu um, let's say a, cu uh, a company or a piece of property or a road or a cow, something that's, that's tangible, you can then represent that thing using what we call tokens. So because the, the, the system that's issuing these tokens is trustless and decentralized and permissionless, you're able to exchange these tokens of the cow and know pretty definitively how much of this cow you own. And depending on how you structure this agreement of us owning this cow through tokens, we can decide what it means to own 10% of a cow. 
Maybe it means nothing. Maybe it means if the cow gets sold in the future, you get 10%. Maybe it means something else. And all these things open up very, very complex human agreements that are hard-coded, that are, that are backed by technology that makes it difficult, if not impossible, to screw each other over. And that idea that we can enter into very complex things that extend beyond our circle of trust allows us, and us I mean like, you know, everyone, but especially Armenians, to cooperate in ways that before were impossible because we have a history of screwing each other over. So by taking out that, that, that risk or minimizing that risk, it's going to allow us to progress way faster than if we try to become everyone's friend, you know? Um, so other examples of tokenization, we could tokenize this road and we could be responsible for owning and repairing and managing the road. And um, I've, I'm very infatuated by this idea. I actually created a paper called the Armenian Dece uh, Digital Nation, which kind of throws out the idea of well, what, if we, what can we really accomplish with this technology and what, to what levels of governance technology can we hope to achieve with this type of stuff. So if you're interested, I have a copy here. You can scan it and get it at home. Uh, read, read it today, and um, uh, yeah, this was short notice. I hope I sort of gave a good brief understanding. But let's go to question and answer. Um, yeah, Bobby. Um, yeah. Uh, is quite interesting, uh, but still one question just arises for me because we live within the state which has its legislation, and until the state adopts or legislation accepts all these ideas or all these principles of blockchain and cryptocurrency. How are you going to use, for example, your crypto in Armenia, for example? I, I really don't know, maybe I have some information, maybe I'm mistaken, but I really don't know how I'm going to use this crypto in Armenia. Or, for example, tokenization, tokenization if, if I hold the code for 10% uh, via this technology of blockchain, how the state or state bodies are going to that I really own this call because my partner who wants to, to cheat me and say can go to the state but and say the whole call is, is mine because according to state documents it is like that but in blockchain reality it is something different and will the state accept blockchain reality or the state body reality this is confusing to me yeah so that so you're really talking about the interfacing of the, the new paradigm and the old paradigm and what will it look like how it will work so <coughs> There are countries in the world that have come down super hard on crypto and the adoption of crypto has been slower. That being said, no government in the world can stop you from interacting with someone else through crypto. So if you and your supplier or your employer or whatever say, I'm gonna pay you in crypto, it really doesn't matter what the government says because they can't stop it. But if I cannot utilize this crypto in my country, why did I need it? We can exchange a lot of cryptos, me and you. And I have, let's say, 1,000 cryptos on my account. What can I do with it in Armenia if, uh, let's say, I cannot use it in Armenia? Yeah. So maybe, sorry, maybe I can buy something online, like in online books, books which accept crypto. But I mean, this will not solve the, the problem that I can fully use the money I own, crypto money. Yeah. You're right, you're right. So if you can't convince someone that you want to buy something from someone with to accept your crypto, then what you're, you're forced to do is enter back into the existing monetary system by selling your crypto and getting drawn for it, which actually isn't that difficult, supposing you have a bank account. So you, you can do that, and it's not an elegant solution, but that's sort of the, the reality of, of where we are today. We're not yet in this future crypto world. That being said, I recently hired Armenian translators to edit the videos that we made. And we interviewed six translators and only one of them refused to be paid in crypto. So that's today. So if you want, you can pay people in crypto and more often than not, they will take your crypto. For instance, the, the uh, FBZ, the Free Economic Zone uh, issuer, the people who wrote our Free Economic Zone today, we're paying them in crypto. And I mean, they're not normal people, but if, you, if you're interested in it, you look around, you can actually you can live off crypto. There, there will be inconveniences where you're forced to, to buy drama with your Bitcoin, but it's doable. As for contracts, that's more complicated, definitely. So, may, may I take a 
huge picture that's uh, very stark in my mind. Uh, so, as Sevan said, you can, I mean, if you get paid in crypto, okay, and you need now drums to buy something because you can't buy it in crypto, uh, you can exchange crypto for drums. That could be done. You can exchange crypto to dollars, dollars to drums, it's all available. And it can be done in a reasonable amount of time. Who is deciding the exchange between crypto and drums? Oh, there are exchanges that uh, have the published rate of currency. But is it changing? As in the market decides. I mean, you, you can, just like the net bank, you know, if you go... The market decides what the value of the coin is. Exactly. And then there's a fee right. on top of that for where issuers, where you're getting drums from. But it's the market that decides what the coin is. Right. I mean, for example, if you have Russian rubles and you can't use them in Armenia, you go to the bank, give your rubles, and get drums, and you can spend it. The same uh, mechanism exists in the uh, in the crypto world. Now, uh, there are a couple of things that I want to highlight. So when we talk about blockchain, trustless system, it's a system that not that's not designed for you not to trust. It's a system that doesn't require you to trust to do business with. Okay? Why? Because, for example, if I have, um, if I sell this to um, Seven. Okay. Now, as I said before, how do you register the sale? Okay. This sale gets registered in a blockchain, and blockchain is a bunch of servers. Okay. All over the place. Thousands, tens of, tens of thousands of servers, and they need to reconcile with each other. They need to communicate with each other that this transaction took place. If they don't agree with that transaction, it's thrown out because it's not reliable. If one or two of the modes or blocks are broken and they don't agree with the rest of the blockchain for this transaction, those nodes are thrown out. So you have a safety system. And for example, let's assume that you have your money in Converse Bank, okay? And Converse Bank goes out of business. Possible, right? Possible, but I have some guarantees. Well, guarantees are not worth very much, and I'll tell you why. Uh, in the US in 2008, uh, Lehman Brothers went out of business. People lost Millions of dollars. In spite of the guarantees, it didn't mean anything. Well, the Soviet banks, right? They probably have guarantees too. That's right. So, if the financial system collapses, which is possible, we're not hoping for it, okay, because we will have societal problems if that happens. While we're not hoping for it, it's a real possibility. It almost happened in 2007 and 8, and if it happens again, the outcome will be much worse. So if you, by contrast, and I'm not promoting purchase of crypto, by the way, here. No, uh, no. Uh, if by some chance you have your account at Converse Bank and the financial system collapses, all Converse Bank needs to do, in the Depression era, they put headlocks on the doors of banks, so you couldn't enter the banks to get your money. In this environment, all they need to do is flick a switch and stop access to their system. That's all they need to do. So there's no way you can access your money if that were to happen. Whereas, if you own crypto, let's say, again, I'm not promoting crypto. If you own crypto, the only way your crypto would not be accessible is if the entire internet went down. So internet, imagine, internet gets shut down. Now you have to think about what happens if the internet gets, gets shut down. All financial institutions will be shut down if the internet gets shut down. Okay? All defense systems, military systems, everything will be shut down. All global commerce will be shut down. Okay? Your ability to travel would be non-existent because they won't be able to scan your passport and get the information. So everything will be shut down. So the probabilities of the internet getting shut down is very slim. And hence, crypto will be available to you for as long as the internet is not 
shut down. Now, the reason, and you can correct me because you know a lot more about this than I do, the reason Bitcoin came into existence is because people lost, or at least some people started losing trust in the financial system. And what that meant is that the financial system was printing money at such a rapid rate that you didn't really know what the value of your currency was. And one of the reasons, for example, Bitcoin came into existence the way it did is because you can't print Bitcoin. You can mine it, but mining is limited to a certain number. It's 21 million? Yeah, it's limited, it's capped. So the algorithm doesn't allow you to print more. In other words, nobody can enter the system and change that. Whereas with central banks, they can push a button and print as much currency as they want. That's the reason this came into existence. Now, of course, it's controversial because it's like the gold rush, right? When gold rush came about, it wasn't the value of gold that was questioned. It was the number of people and companies and entities that claim to have a gold mine and be able to dig out gold that would be valuable and they sold that concept to others and they cheated them. That was the problem, not the value of gold. Okay? And the same thing here is the value of blockchain, the integrity of blockchain, the value of Bitcoin even isn't in question. But there are a lot of charlatans out there go and sell the concept because it's popular and Bitcoin went from a penny to a peak, 19,000 and change in value, magic. Less than 10 years, it goes from a penny in value to 19,000. I don't think any asset, no Google, no Apple, no Amazon, has appreciated in value like that. So when, when charlatans see that, they like to take advantage of it. And they like to send, uh, they, they try to uh, sell you a snake oil. Okay. And so that is what discredits the field, not what it is, not what it can do. And so that's, that's why this is an area that will drive a lot of things. And, and cryptocurrency is just an application of blockchain, just an application, just like. Facebook is an application of internet. Amazon is another application of internet. You know, uh, uh, WhatsApp or what have you. They're all different applications of internet. So crypto happens to be one type of application of blockchain. But there are a lot of business applications that will emerge. There are a lot of uh, asset uh, uh, transaction applications that will emerge. And time and, of opportunity has been and, uh, right. That's right, and that's critical, actually. So uh, when we talk, for example, uh, Sevan and I have talked about this a little bit. Right now, if you want to access capital for business, there are two sources of capital, two major sources of capital. One is stocks, okay? So if you sell stock, you buy a piece of the company, a piece of something, okay? Or you can borrow money. The bank and say, I want to borrow money in order to grow my business. Those are the two major classes of capital. Now, it's entirely possible that tokenization of assets and services, both, could become a class of capital that will far exceed the aggregate value of equity and debt. It's possible. But we're in the very beginning stages of that. And one of the reasons I wanted to touch upon this subject is because it's such a innovative, revolutionary technology and medium that at a minimum, we need to know about it. We need to track it. Because if it becomes something of significant magnitude, and we're not with it, it's like imagine Armenia uh, did not have internet until uh, 10 years after the internet was invented. Imagine what kind of a disadvantage that would pose for Armenia. So that's why this is an introduction of something that is brand new 
and it is very worthy of following, tracking, and monitoring the progress of, so that when it takes off, we're not caught by surprise, and we can participate in it. That's the reason. Is that? Yeah, that, and I, I just want to throw out some definitions because I realized, having here heard Gatto, I didn't really explain what blockchain is very well. So just let's do a real high level definitions. The blockchain is a ledger, okay? So imagine a big book that people write the truth, history. That is what the blockchain is. So if you're trying to conceptualize what is the blockchain, it's a distributed ledger, meaning it's a ledger that's chopped up and all over the world and no one can take down and no one can forge. So it's the truth, so it's history, okay? That's the blockchain. What is cryptocurrency? It's a digital asset, okay? It's a thing, just like a barrel of oil is a thing, except for it's digital. You can't touch it, but it exists. And it's provably scarce, it's provably yours if you own it, and you can send it to anyone you want, provably, right? So those are two really important definitional things to comprehend. Um, any other questions? So, uh, Anibi, first of all, a wonderful, very lucid summary. It's a complex subject, so I really appreciate you summarizing this way. So we're just uh, trying to prototype with one of the ideas we had, a collaborative uh, content creation. Uh, we had Hwang's idea yesterday, how we can create uh, courseware, that can be you know, uh, approved by Guad for brand and does a Guad product. So, um, in collaboratively co-creating a content, a digital content, it is something that you can do today, this exercise would help us prototype something that would say, well, hey, let's tokenize and have, let's track it and use some, some distributed uh, technology to um, track the ownership. Say, we have a teacher that's co-creating that content, we have students who are co-creating that content, and perhaps even a donor who decides to sponsor that course creation, and we try to, to uh, track that with, uh, with the blockchain. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what does co-op have? It has the physical infrastructure, which could potentially be tokenized. It has the content, as you mentioned, that could potentially be tokenized. It even has the, the human capital. You know, like we're investing in students, but it's, it's, a, it's an informal definition of, of investment. You could potentially tokenize the future earnings of the students up to a certain amount, so that becomes their tuition. Is that a good idea? I don't know. Maybe. But the content, yeah, why not? Yeah, I could, totally. Questions? Yeah. Up? So Birma over there had a very interesting experience fighting the authoritarian regime in, uh, in Venezuela using cryptocurrency, where it was impossible to send money to Venezuela. The government had blocked everything, and uh, he managed to crowdfund his own escape from the country. And uh, he has a lot to say about how all of the dissidents networks in Venezuela and all the people who are opposing the bureau have to use cryptocurrency because nothing else works. Yeah. So should I? Yeah, tell us about it. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Guillermo, I'm from Venezuela, and uh, I crowdfund my escape from Venezuela using Bitcoin. And uh, here's the thing. Uh, all right. <laughs> so, well, we hope the Venezuelan authorities don't get this big this party. Anyway, uh, what happens in Venezuela is that it's a country that, first of all, is extremely blocked uh, by internal and external authorities in the, in the sense of money. Uh, you cannot really use uh, PayPal if you have a Venezuelan bank account or a Venezuelan credit card. The accounts uh, once you get your credit card into PayPal, that is uh, the step that, that is needed to uh, verify your PayPal account, your account gets shut down, all right? So you can't send uh, US dollars to, through Western Union, for example, because the government implemented uh, currency exchange rates, uh, like fluent fixed currency exchange rate. So what happens is that the government decides how much uh, US dollars you can get and uh, who gets them. That's the thing. Um, the thing is that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is borderless. Uh, 
uh, anyone can send Bitcoin to anyone in the world uh, as long as they have internet access. So what happened back then is that I, uh, I started working online. I started working as a remote order freelancer. And uh, I, started, I started earning money through Bitcoin, which at the time value was, I don't know, $120 or something like that. It was around 2013, I think. So it was crazy because I was able to give my workforce to someone at the other side of the world, at the other side of the world, and they were able to pay me in a matter of seconds. So this is something extremely valuable about Bitcoin. The other thing is that no regulation applied to Bitcoin because you can block, you, if you want to block Bitcoin, you will have to block the whole internet. Uh, or or you, you will have to went to a, uh, how do I say it, to an extremely complicated pro process just to block uh, the, whoever is using Bitcoin. <coughs> That's not economically viable, right? Uh, here's the thing, I start working with the Startup Societies Foundation and uh, at some point, I had a certain amount of money uh, left to uh, leave the country, and uh, they had the idea of uh, crowdfunding my uh, my leaving out of the country. So, what they did is that they posted a picture of, uh, let's say, a stack of cash. At that moment, it was I think it was uh, two hundred or something like that. 300 Venezuelan Bolivars, uh, which at the time was around one or two US dollars, right? It was a full stack, a stack of cash. My hand was holding the stack of cash, and it was basically worthless, or it, or it was worth a little, very, very uh, low amount of value, basically. So, what I did is that they also posted the, the address, and uh, the people started. Uh, sending cryptocurrency to the, to the address until we reach the, the amount of uh, money I need and uh, that's basically how it is. I, after I got the Bitcoin I had to exchange the cryptocurrency, uh, some part of it into US dollars to be able to move around Latin America and uh, that's about it. Once I got the cryptocurrency I planned my uh, play out of the country and I went through the border of Colombia then Ecuador, then Peru, and then Chile. And your whole family got out. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, uh, personally, uh, I am here right now talking with all of you thanks to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a technology that has changed my life. And it has impacted uh, me, my family, and probably uh, most of the people I know. Because I have, uh, as, as it has had a huge impact in my life, I have tried to share it and to implement it in different areas of my of my life uh, to make the impact, the impact bigger and, and share like connect with other people's lives as well. Thank you. We have time for more questions. Yeah, one more. Okay. Who's got a juicy question? Who's got? Um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about what other kinds of blockchain applications you're most excited about, just so people can think about blockchain other than in a cryptocurrency. And maybe you mentioned the digital nation, but also one thing that I found, find most interesting and most useful is like um, medical files and using a blockchain to be able to have a trustless way of, of sharing your medical data in a way that's secure and also time sensitive so a hospital can only look at it for a certain amount of time or your outpatient center can only look at it. Yeah. So I'm a healthcare IT consultant, and that application is super exciting, but sadly the technology's not there yet where we can actually do that. Because one sick patient actually has as much data as like the entire Bitcoin blockchain. So in terms of scalability, we can't, we're not there yet. Maybe Holochain, maybe post-blockchain, post post-blockchain, we could do that, but big question mark for mm -hmm. now. Uh, things that I'm excited by though, so my favorite cryptocurrency is called Dash, and one of the reasons I like it the most is because of its organizational structure. It's run by a decentralized, autonomous organization, and it's something I write about extensively in this paper that she referenced, the uh, Armenian Decentralized Nation. And the way that these work is, imagine a company where, the, where it's run by a robot, right? So the board of directors are humans that are basically 
ceding authority and power to a robot that they've programmed to run in a very predictable manner and that basically governs how the organization works. So for Dash specifically, there are these people called masternode operators. And, and to become a masternode operator is essentially to become a, 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 seat, a, what's it called, a board member. And you can vote. So each masternode owner, a thousand Dash makes you a masternode owner, you're now voting member of this community. And they have a treasury. And this treasury is generated by the blockchain itself. So through inflation, that's predictable, program, programmed. And that treasury is voted on by the masternode owners to improve the network. So it's a robot that's improving itself, that's paying humans to do development work, to do marketing work, to do bug fixes, to do all sorts of stuff. And it's without any human intervention, it's just doing it. And you can't stop it. And so I, I see that, I'm like, this is a really cool way of creating money because that's what they're focused on primarily is money. But could we use that technology as our means to provide governance for ourselves? I mean, we're distributed all over the world. I'm an Armenian American, well, what benefit does that have to me? Do I have an Armenian government that's looking out for me, providing me services at the moment? No. But we can make it so through these, these decentralized autonomous organizations. And they can't be stopped. They're transparent, they're trustless, and if, I'm very, very excited by that. Um, and so, you know, we're gonna explore that. We're gonna come up with some examples where we can try to use this and see if it doesn't work like we, we would like it to. Is it as interesting as I think it is? And if it is, you know, maybe, maybe that's the way to go. Um, the other element of crypto, and this isn't so much the DAO, the decentralized autonomous organization, but the uh, concept of tokenization is when you tokenize something that's abstract, so in the paper I, I, I throw out the question, who owns Armenia, right? The people who owns. Who owns Armenia? Who owns Armenia? The people of Armenia. Well, what does that look like? Um, for example, I have a piece of land. So you own property. In my mind. No, in, in my your mind. mind. That I'm responsible. So it's an abstraction, though. Yes. So what if we could make that tangible? What if we can put a token value to that? You've lived here, you've provided all this value to the Armenian nation, and now you can show, you, hey, I have this much say, you know, I've done this much, and, and, and you can't take this from me. So when you go from, so right now we live in a world where there's these, these edge cases where there's this, these abstract notions of, of uh, statehood and, and sovereignty, but when we try to explain it, we're stuck talking sort of in poetry. We're like, I own, Arme I'm Armenian, therefore, and then it, just trust me, you know, and that's kind of what it ends up being, or else, you know, it becomes kind of violent. Um, what if we can get to a point where our means actually physically own Armenia, where this road isn't owned by some corrupt mayor, I don't know if it is, just an example, what if it's actually owned by the people that use this road every day, and they're the responsible ones for it? It's totally doable, we can get there, and that's what I'm excited by, is when we tokenize stuff that, 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 that aligns the, the needs of the people using it with the, and they become the stakeholders and they're responsible for the upkeep, maintenance, and the direction that society heads in general. And um, it's, it's a hard thing to really wrap your mind around, but I mean, there's such huge, I think there's such huge potential in that, so that excites me. We'll do one more question, because I was looking. So Stefan, this is like a new world order, so I'm curious to see, have governments naturally been opposed to Governments are trying to co-opt it, I think, because you can't stop it. So the, the smart money is on co-opting it and trying to pervert it and slow it down and make it less impactful. But you can't stop it. You, 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 short of turning off the electricity, you can't stop it. I mean, uh, this is very true. What's happening with different government agencies, and I'm familiar, for example, with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So the Securities and Exchange Commission in, in uh, America is a, a policing uh, entity of the uh, all, all kinds of securities, bonds, stocks, and so on and so forth. And so what's going on right now is, as Sevan said, the hierarchy of the SEC recognizes that blockchain, tokenization, cryptocurrency is inevitable. Inevitable. Okay. However, the lower ranks, whose jobs depend on 
the old system are having a very difficult time of resisting. So within the SEC now, there is this fight going on. And so uh, what's going to happen with uh, blockchain technology and, and cryptocurrency and other um, uh, tokenization uh, vehicles, the whole established financial system will be threatened by it. Okay. Unless, as Sevan said, they embrace it. But in the context of embracing it, they have so much at stake with the old uh, paradigm. For example, Alice just showed me uh, there's a big merger of Bristol Myers and Celgene Corporation. They're, you know, uh, Bristol Myers is an $80 billion pharmaceutical company, Celgene is a $60 billion pharmaceutical company, biotech company, so they're merging. And uh, Morgan Stanley, that represents uh, Bristol Myers, stands to make over $200 million in fees. $200 million for a transaction that they had very little to do other than, you know, uh, uh, posturing for the board of directors what they should and should, should not be doing. I mean, it's laughable. But that system could be shaken up if the new world order, as you say, comes in. Now, clearly, this is not going to happen tomorrow. But clearly, it's not going to take 10 years for it to happen. No, I know. Yeah, because things are moving in such a astronomical rate that hence our reasons for why we need to be up the game on this so that we understand it, we can monitor it. That's, that's all we need to do. We need to monitor it and not poo-poo it as the rest of the system may. Okay. Anyway. Right. So just